Baylor has accumulated its best transfer class in school history, and they've added another with quarterback R.J. Martinez. This is Locked on Baylor. You are Locked on Baylor, your daily podcast on the Baylor Bears, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Welcome to Locked On Baylor, and thank you for making this show, Locked On Baylor, your first listen every single day. Drake Toll from Sports Illustrated's Inside the Bears, alongside John Garcia Jr., the Director of Football Recruiting at SI. John, to jump right into it, R.J. Martinez, quarterback out of Northern Arizona, originally out of Austin, Texas. Had I asked you about R.J. Martinez or really anybody in the college football world two or three years ago in high school, you might not have heard much, but this guy has all of the snaps at NAU and brings a ton of experience to a Baylor quarterback room that's finally shaping up. Yeah, this is something that was necessary. I think we talked about it the last time I was lucky enough to be on with you, Drake. This was necessary in every single way. And I I thought how Baylor would, would settle this quarterback room would be pretty telling. And I think bringing in a guy, like you said, who has this sort of experience and then his skill set, which we'll get into, really fits as a counter to to some of these other Baylor quarterbacks. I thought that worked incredibly well. Uh, Martinez, obviously, uh, like you said, not as highly profiled coming out of high school. Looks on the smaller side, uh, even though, hey, in high school, really productive three-year starter in the city of Austin, but had to go to NAU and boom, as a true freshman, got thrown into the fire and helped hold off Arizona for for their first win yeah. over Arizona since like the 30s. So there is something to be said for him in terms of the experience and I think sheer playmaking ability. The arm strength is good. Um, I think his pocket mechanics are good. His footwork is good. But what is the most appealing element to him beyond the experience, in my eyes, Drake, is his pocket mobility. There is an elusiveness to this kid. Um, You you don't want to say Bryce Young, but some of the ways that Martinez buys his receivers time, it's not to scramble Mm -hmm. to use his legs as a runner. It's more so to buy his wideouts time. That that creates a playmaking ability that you like. There is a risk-taking element that he's got there as well, a bit of a gunslinger in that regard. And and he upped his production every year that, that he play football as a high schooler and as as a uh, an FCS player. So I do think profile wise that makes a lot of sense for what Baylor needs to liven up this quarterback competition and make it, you know, make it about as as interesting as possible given the circumstances and given the timelines that are pretty narrow at this point. Once Spencer Sanders and and Tristan Gebbia came off the board, that was kind of it. So circling back however quickly they did to Martinez I thought was was pretty telling, and it was good to get it done from the Baylor perspective. And now you go into spring with uh, with three guys, and you let the chips fall where they may. Yeah, the the mention of Martinez and what he can do with his legs, he's not going to Josh Allen light you up. He, he's not going to get uh, north and south very often. But even looking at his, his rushing numbers, 70 carries for 68 yards this past year with a fraudulent Northern Arizona offensive line, you, you expect that sacks were big at play, but still eight rushing touchdowns. So when he's got to get it done, he's got the, he's got the moxie to do it. Uh, and, and what I really – what I'm intrigued by with this, John – is had Gebbia come to Baylor, I, I don't think there's an option where he starts. I don't think there's an option where he vies to start here. Uh, and there are a lot of those those veterans, even Alan Bowman, I don't think would have fit in that role for the Bears. But R.J. Martinez feels like a guy, as young as he is, as many snaps as he's gotten, he's not coming here to be a guy that sits on the bench and gives some pointers to Blake Shapen and Sawyer Robertson. He's got the experience to at least make this quarterback competition somewhat interesting. Yeah, look, he's got the most experience between the three guys, and they're all, give or take a year, they're all about the same age, which which is really intriguing when when you start to look at this thing. And and yeah, I I agree. You don't leave a starting post where, look, you were an all-conference player as a sophomore, a, a national freshman of the year candidate as a freshman. You don't leave that post to go, like you said, sit the bench and and be a mentor to kids that are your age at your position. So at least from his perspective, you you want that chip on your shoulder going back to your home state of Texas to go try to light it up for a program that, like every other Power 5 school, overlooked you at that level. That, that, That is a different motivation. It's a different energy 
that I would presume comes into those quarterback rooms. And skill set wise, again, he plays with that. He plays with energy. That's actually probably the best way to describe him. Mm. There's not one elite trait, but combined with that energy uh, and this playmaking ability, there's there's some gamer in this this quarterback. So I, I do think it's a good situation for Baylor relative to one, all those other quarterback dominoes falling, and two, how hard it is to get a second QB. Once you already have one in the portal committed, especially when you've got a returning starter, really hard to imagine a scenario where you can get a third, yet and still Baylor is one of the few schools that has been able to accomplish it. Yeah, you mentioned Gamer. Uh, and, and John, in the middle segment, I want to jump back into the quarterback room where we hit last week, and now things have been altered even further. Uh, but Gamer from Martinez, 452 passing yards against Montana State. I know a lot of people out there are going to think, okay, you got a guy who's coming from the FCS ranks, but 452 and three passing touchdowns against Montana State, that, that says a lot of the FCS ranks. And three and eight record, but of his six FCS losses, five were within one score. You said gamer expand on that a little bit more. Cause, cause that's even what this, this schedule and his stat line, that's what it says. A gamer gives you a shot, man. That, that's, that's what it is. It's, it's a guy who can play within the margins and compensate for some of the physical limitations that he and, or his personnel or offense may present um you know Brock Purdy's getting a lot of that in the NFL right now right he's a gamer right he doesn't have to do the Josh Allen uh, you know Joe Burrow type things but he's still finding a way to make a similar statistical impact and I think that's where you can see some of those same uh compliments towards RJ Martinez uh, the gamer means that you're also willing to get dirty um he's tough he's taking huge hits while pushing the ball down the field. You mentioned the rushing numbers that are a bit askew because for some reason college football is still docking rushing yardage yeah. when you get sacked. I mean, it's archaic, but it, it's still happening. But yeah, nose for the end zone, eight rushing touchdowns, just willing to, at 185 or 190, whatever he is, willing to take a little bit of punishment for his team. And that's the kind of guy who works well in between the margins and can win a locker room over very, very quickly. Um, and, and there's also some... I don't want to d diminish or, or minimize mm. some of the quarterbacking traits that he brings to the table. I don't want to present him as he's only living in the margins. I mean, there are some throws on his tape. And, you know, when you're FCS, you put out your own highlight tape, thankfully for us, because we get to see a lot more of it. Yeah. I mean, he's working left, sprinting, and comes to a dead stop and throws the ball 45 yards down the field across his body. Now, very FCS type of throw. You probably don't do that in the FBS, but you have the ability to do it in a pinch. It just it just means you're never sort of out of it. Third and 16 against a good pass rush. It's not just a draw play when you've got R.J. Martinez as your quarterback. You're going to give him a chance and an opportunity to make the plays that uh, that really shouldn't be probable. John, R.J. Martinez comes from Northern Arizona. That is that's it's FCS. You, you make the jump into the FBS realm and the, obviously the game changes. But we've seen. FCS quarterbacks have a lot of success at the yep. at the pro level and guys who have transferred up into the Division One FBS level. What's the timeline on a kid like this? Can can you take one really good instructive spring with this coaching staff at Baylor and and be ready for a Big 12 level of competition? I actually think the scheme helps here. It's going to help to curb that that transition because there's no doubt that there will be a transition, particularly for RJ with what you're seeing up front, the sheer size yeah. of the linemen, both on your side and on the other side will create a little bit of, of additional resistance uh, more so than the speed of the receivers and the defensive backs. When, when you get smaller statured guys, I mean, for the most part, they're in the same ballpark. It doesn't, it, there's mm -hmm. guys running four, four in the FCS. That's absolutely true, but there might not be an O line that averages, you know, six, five, three twenty like, like Texas might. Uh, here in 2023. So it's those things that I think take the most adjustment to. But schematically here, I think there's a lot of advantages towards picking a school like Baylor for him because it's not this wide open offense that puts every single element of it on the quarterback's shoulders. It's not RPO based. It's not empty set all day type of offenses where it's like if if you are behind, it will show dramatically. Instead, to go back to the Brock Purdy uh, comparison, now you're able to utilize the, 
the scheme and those around you to to blend in if you need to, if you are taking a little bit more time, because there is going to be a ground game. There's going to be an emphasis on ball control and time of possession. It's not going to be 45 pass attempts Mm -hmm. every single um, game. So I do think there are some things schematically that help with the transition, but the sheer size of the big boys up front, I think will be, you know, sort of the most alarming for him to deal with, at least in the short term. And then you see where the chips fall thereafter. Yeah, luckily in spring practice, uh, you'll get used to it pretty easily with Baylor because they got some bodies up front defensively. And John, you now have got three quarterbacks, but to me, there's there's still leeway to add one more. There's still leeway to refine this group more. So uh, I want to get I want to jump right into that, but first jump into fan duel. Tell you what, fan duel right now, a one place. For your sports betting needs. I have uh, very recently gotten into sports betting hockey. So I'm not having a lot of success with college basketball, to be honest with all of you. Uh, It's too, there's too much stuff going on. None of those stuff that you think is going to happen happens. But in hockey, you can go and take like the Dallas Stars or minus one and a half. It's like plus 150. They win a lot of these games by two or three. And when they do, you make a lot of money. I found that hockey is super profitable. And it's, I've got a roommate. He's Canadian. Um, meaning he's from Canada and watches a lot of hockey and he sends his best bets every day and they're all hockey and FanDuel is where I have gone to make money. Uh, you can do it right now. You put $5 down on the Dallas Stars to win a hockey game. You get $150 in free bets. It's 150 bucks. Even if you don't watch hockey, I don't watch hockey. I think it's boring and terrible. But if it makes me money, boy, and anything's exciting, but it makes me $150 bucks, uh, right now, FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel.com slash locked on. Combine your bets. You can parlay stuff, same game parlays, point spreads, player props, you name it. FanDuel, all of that. And it's safe. It's easy to use. FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel and with the AFC and NFC championships coming up this weekend. It is the official sponsor of the NFL. That is FanDuel.com. John, three quarterbacks. I, uh, I'm i old enough to remember when Ohio State had like six quarterbacks in their QB room literally this past yeah. summer. Yeah. Um, there are teams, uh, it feels like the, those teams, that'll take big quarterbacks out of a class and load up their rooms. We are in the midst of, in the closing era of wave one of transfers, and you'll see your Gary Bohannon types toward the end of the spring. Um, what are the odds? And to you, if you're if you're the one manning this quarterback room, do you add somebody else to this now three headed monster? It's certainly possible. And I think again, every single coaching staff is hitting the portal every day, at least in principle, at least to see who is available. So if and when these spring battles wind down and some of these races become pretty apparent, and and you know as a quarterback, hey, I'm I'm number two at best or worse, number three at best, yeah. you're going to see some portal movement. I mean, there's really no uh, no way it doesn't happen in, in volume. So even just casually looking at the, the state of college football, think about these great quarterbacks that are about to go into the draft, right? Um, that means they're going to be replaced thereafter by some type of battle. So you think of, okay, Alabama, Ohio State, um, I mean, shoot, Ole Miss might have a huge battle, mm-hmm. even though it's got a returning starter. But you think of the schools that have quarterbacks that are going to be selected, Florida among them. And naturally, the dust thereafter is going to create some momentum in the spring. Heck, Georgia, the national champs. I mean, yeah. Stetson Bennett is finally gone after age 30. And now there's going to be three or four guys competing for that gig. So naturally, if you don't win out after sitting behind a Stetson Bennett or a Bryce Young or a C.J. Stroud, you might look to move on because from a business standpoint, everybody's window is very small in college football. So I think every single program that isn't quite settled come May 1st, let's say, is going to take a look. And there's going to be some drastic and I think quick quarterback movements. So if it's either unsettled at Baylor or it's it's maybe not as competitive as you, as you wanted mm. it to be, which is a possibility, right? A negative one, but it's a possibility. Then I do think you see at least an effort towards adding uh, another quarterback prospect. Uh, and you, you mentioned it. I mean, we just saw it last year with Gary Bohannon. That's, that's when some of these moves were made. And um, this is, that was before we, we had kind of the full grasp of, of how crazy the portal can be. And now we're seeing it in full force. So you expect more movement this may, than May of 2022. So yeah, if it's either unsettled or 
not as competitive to Blake Shapin in particular, because yeah. let's call it what it is. It's about pushing Blake either to propel him forward as he takes a jump uh, in 23 or to unseat him. I mean, that's really what it is. If, if that doesn't work out the way Dave Aranda and company envision, then yeah, I do believe Baylor could look into the, the portal and there's going to be some blue chip type recruits uh, that have sat a couple years at good schools that will presumably be available. Sawyer Robertson. I mean, that's, that's, that's Sawyer Robertson is exactly what he came from. Uh, had you here, I'll go, I'll, I'll go here next. I'll skip a couple questions on my list um, because you, you, you've, settled in on Blake shape in there. And one of my big concerns, my, my not concerns necessarily, but something on my radar this off season, if Blake Shapin's named the starter game one next year and RJ Martinez and Sawyer Robertson are on the pine, Baylor fans are going to be antsy after seeing what Shapin did this last year. He just had a bad year. Can you, and this, I probably ask this every week for the rest of the off season. Can you calm Baylor fans, myself included, down if Blake Shapin is named the eventual starter for the Bears? If you win, sure. I mean, it's it's thankfully it's very simple because we're we're not uh all engineering majors and all that. It's very simple. If you put W's on the board, yeah, you can quell e even the most passionate or, or lack thereof fan bases across this sport. But yeah, it's you better be sure. You you better have conviction in this decision. And I think it took some boldness last year to, to make the call as early as Aranda did right or wrong. He had conviction with it enough to nudge Bohannon towards South Florida and, and then allow those chips to fall. So if, if you feel that, that same path towards shaping or anyone else, you, you've got to be sure. Cause I think even if it's somebody else, it's still going to be the elephant in the room because you're going to have, if it's not shaping, you're going to have a very experienced Baylor quarterback sitting on the bench and or another quarterback with at least a couple years of of experience uh, to his name, whether it's Martinez uh, or Robertson. So I think that angst is going to live there um, into September. And we've seen quarterback battles dip into to that month as well. There's nothing there's nothing in stone that says this battle will be close to settled in May. Most mm -hmm. of them, you, you start to get the idea, especially if you're on that roster or a coach there, you, you you get the idea pretty early, but it doesn't mean the head man is on board. You know, so I think that is important to factor in as well. The timeline of Dave Aranda's feel yeah. for this quarterback competition will be revealing. Um, so, yeah, if for some reason it's not quite settled day one, game one, and you revert back to Blake Shapin because he has the most Baylor experience, you, you've got to have conviction there because, yeah, the fan base – will come calling. And unfortunately for Dave and every school that's looking for a bounce back year, it, it's about what you did for me lately. Uh, it's not about the, the Big 12 title two years ago anymore, right? It's about mm. 2023. We're now two years removed from, from that group, right? So uh, folks have very short-term memory and it's probably shrinking as, as time progresses. So yeah, that's going to be, unfortunately for Dave, that's going to be the first flagpole moment of, of the 2023 season for Baylor. It's the decision that happens before the first snap is made. John, before jumping, we talked a lot about offense before jumping into a bit on the defensive side. Uh, had you told me circa a month ago that Baylor's quarterback room was Blake shape and Sawyer Robertson and RJ Martinez, I would have probably punched some so I, I was just like, what? I had never, those names weren't on my radar. Right. Uh, and, and every Baylor fan's waiting on a Hudson card or somebody to come and save the day in Waco. But now with more context, given the research on these guys and, and what they bring to the table, feels like Baylor's quarterback room has shaped up to be serviceable at the very least in the Big 12. What do you make of, of this group? Where do you put them amongst other teams in this new and expanding conference? Oh, well, that's a great question. I think for Baylor, you you had to hit two marks, right? We talked about volume on the last show that we did together. You hit that mark in Sharpie, which is great. You needed to have three guys. They all now happen to have college experience. That is all but ideal. And I, th I thought the second mark was you had to have variants, whether it was Hudson Card or Spencer Sanders or whoever. You had to bring in a diverse group of mm -hmm. quarterbacks. And I think you have three very different quarterback prospects that are going to head into this battle, right? You, you've got your big Texas 
air raid, air it out type of passer in, in Robertson who brings some athleticism to the table as a counter. You've got your chip on your shoulder, run around gamer kind of energy quarterback in Martinez. And then you've got the guy who's who's been there, who's kind of in the middle, right? He's kind of he's kind of flirting between both of those those two uh characteristic points in Blake Shapin with of course the the caveat of having the experience at Baylor. So you've got three different style of quarterbacks that are going to go into this battle. I think that's exactly what you could have hoped for. Now the hope is to see it become intense, to see it become close. You, you need those headlines. If you if you're uh bookmarking some some Google searches on the the Baylor front, you need intense battles uh, and competition uh, feels for this this quarterback group and then relative to the big 12 look you've got a handful of schools that are going to make a transition and a handful that are not i think looking at the schools that finished at or near the top of the league you've got a lot of transition there um i, I think well obviously um duggan is gone sanders is gone Martinez finally ran out of eligibility at K-State now. So you're going to see a lot of transition with those programs. And then where you feel like it's supposed to be stable is Quinn Ewers at Texas. But here comes Arch Manning. How does that Mm -hmm. look? Speaking of, you better be right. Uh, I think Steve Sarkeesian's got a lot more of that on his plate than, than Dave Aranda. So I think relative to the rest of the Big 12, you feel good in that you have a lot of variance in your quarterback room. And it's not there's no shoe in. There's no politi- politically correct pick at this point. It is totally wide open, and that, that's not something you can say in Austin. It's probably not something you can say in Fort Worth, even though depending on how the portal and high school recruiting shakes out, that could be interesting relative to uh, Mr. Morris there. It doesn't have to be politically correct at Baylor, and that is traditional, and that's the way that Dave Aranda should want it. So I think in that regard, it's an advantage with three guys as opposed to two where it's the classic – We've got our returning starter, and then we've got maybe a very different style of quarterback to compete yeah. with him. It's not the case there in Baylor. There are three very different quarterbacks with different levels of experience that all, as we stand today, I feel like have some type of shot. Yeah. Now, John, defensively, Matt Palage coming from Oregon. <laughs> Had you told me a month ago that Baylor's D coordinator would be Matt Palage, uh, I again, I was like, okay, well, I hope this works out. And <laughs> with context and more research, Again, it feels like this younger guy who brings a lot of energy uh, can be a mentee to Dave Aranda. And and even right before that, he, he officially took the job. Isaiah Dunson comes from Miami, a, a highly touted four-star cornerback. Uh, there are pieces of this defense that are being solidified. When it comes to Dunson and Powledge and the way that Baylor's adding to this unit, are, are you confident in this hire still? And and even what does Dunson individually bring that could be a spark? Because he seems kind of that that marquee guy for this this defensive squad. Look, Powledge has experience with Dave. I mean that that's really what it comes down to. Um, if if Aranda was older and maybe more experienced, nobody would bat an eye at this hire because when when a Saban or a Smart does it uh and brings back somebody that he he knows and trusts and has already coached over everybody just says okay yeah we trust him so it, it's a, a big deal great hire um but when a younger coach does it it doesn't quite hit the same but it should especially when you you get you're given Dave Aranda's credentials and look the last time Palage was there things were pretty good defensively for Baylor. Okay. this was That's one true. of the best units we've seen in the last few years independent of of conference so I think that understanding of the system and how Dave wants to operate will on, not only allow Palage to be better this time around at Baylor, obviously more responsibility is attached to that, but it'll probably free up Aranda a little bit more because mm-hmm. now he's got somebody who already knows and believes in his system. Two hurdles that a new hire are, are you know unknown. Those are unknown hurdles for a new hire versus uh, bringing in Palage. You already have that established. So maybe Aranda could be a little bit more CEO like, which maybe that's hard for him. You know, he's a guy who who has been so defensively focused for so long um, that maybe it's hard for him to take that step back. This will theoretically allow him to do that just a little bit more. And then when you talk about Isaiah Dunson, this is a great fit. You want new age, modern corners that can compete 
And then you got the caveat of experience on top of it here with, with Dunson. Um, 6'1", 190 or so, extremely long. A kid who can, or a young man, I should say, who could really run, uh, who's got some pedigree coming out of the state of Georgia, as you mentioned, a blue chip recruit uh, a few years ago. This is uh, following his third year of college ball, an increased role every year, even though he never broke through as that surefire starter. You do feel like he's got the physical tools and now the maturity combined with it to come in and work. And you you don't commit to Baylor on defense if you're not willing to come in and do that. And it should be noted with Dunson that he got over recruited at Miami because of the portal. Uh, Tyreek Stevenson is being mocked in the first round right now. That was the spot that two years ago folks thought Dunson was going to assimilate towards as a starter there at the U. So uh, that wasn't the issue for Mario Cristobal's program this this past season. So I do think there's something to be said for the rest of the cornerback room that he's coming from as well. And then to tie it back to Pallage, look at what he did with that Oregon secondary. That was yeah. a great group last year. Christian Gonzalez is going to be mocked higher than Tyreek Stevenson. I top 10 in one draft uh, yesterday that I saw in, in this time of year. So I think that pedigree is really important uh, on both ends. And, and yeah, I think Dunson's going to be a guy who makes plays for Baylor this fall. Dude, Baylor's building it. They got Ed Orgeron's son on staff. Uh, yeah. How, how do you lose at this point? Um, exactly. It's it's come together, it feels like, in the offseason, where a month ago there were so many question marks. Uh, it, finally, it's come together. And, John, when we have you on next week, Baylor will probably have another quarterback that we can talk about, uh, or at least hopefully something, as this first wave of portal finally starts to wane down. Uh, John, I, I know your work, even despite that, doesn't stop. Where can people find your writing, not just on Baylor, but across the full scope of college athletics? Yeah, of course. SI.com slash college. And uh, we're, we're talking ball at every level on Twitter every day. John Garcia underscore JR. Eight days till uh, the traditional signing day. So there's still some dust to settle on that front, just like it is in the portal. Yeah, eight days in the whiteboard there. Uh, real excited. That one got me juiced up today. Uh, John, thanks for joining the show. As always, always a pleasure to get your insight. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. For the, for those out there listening, thank you for making Locked on Baylor your first listen every single day. Come back tomorrow, I think. I think if it all works out, RJ Martinez actually joins the show. This has been always will be locked on. Thanks for making the first listen every single day. Baylor.